Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Ui. I'm from Taiping, Malaysia, and I'm a horror writer. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabel Yap. I'm a Filipino author of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Hi there. Um, I'm Cassandra Ka. I'm originally from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and across the last 11 years or so, I somehow went from an equatorial place all the way to Montreal, Quebec, which is about as frozen as you can get without being in the Arctic. So what it was it that uh, started me writing horror stories? Well, some of them are from books, from TV series, movies, and even my hometown itself. I also was uh, very influenced by this set of books called Pen Book of Horror Stories. I just got a few of them, but they're amazing. I have them with me all this while, and I'm still looking for those that I haven't collected. Just to show you some of them, these are all a pen book of horror stories. And there's, I think, 33 of them. I only got a few of them here. And I would save up all my money. I was just a teenager. And I would get these books as many as I could. And whenever, after reading them, I get so inspired, like, wow, you know, I could do something like that. So all this helped with uh, writing horror stories. And of course, the king himself, Stephen King. We have Stephen King here in Malaysia as well. So every now and then we hear Stephen King and his book is out. So all these are all the excitement. I actually am a huge scaredy cat. Like I can't watch horror movies myself. So it's kind of funny that I write horror. Um, but part of why I'm afraid is because I actually believe in these things. So I do believe in like ghosts. Um, you know, I, I think it's rare to meet a Filipino who doesn't. Uh, it's, it is a part of our everyday lives. I feel really lucky that I haven't met one. But, you know, it's something that I worry about <laughs> when I go to very dimly lit areas. I draw a lot of horror inspiration from Malaysian folklore, from Chinese folklore, really into Asian horror. Uh, the Eye was a really big influence on me when I was younger. I love Shudder. I have a strange affection for writers like Betley Little as well, but I do love the works of Zina Rocklin, Premi Muhammad, Paul Tremblay, um, Chuck Wendick's book of accidents is great. I'm not actually giving you a list of books I sh you should be reading and inspirations, but I'm going to talk about my favorite things anyway. So when I started writing horror stories, I got everything. Uh, I started with this, my first book, which was called, which was called Bedtime Stories from the Date of Night. And, and then it led to this triptych of terror by the same publisher, it says, uh, here be nightmares, there be monsters, them horrors be everywhere. So what happened was, when I wrote this book, I was very influenced by the American and by the English type of uh, style, horror story writing. But when I went into these three books, this one still had the remnants of influence of US and UK especially. And then this one was in between. And finally, this one was the last one where everything became very Malaysia, Southeast Asia. And I will come to that in my latest one, which is Typing Tales of Terror, published by Penguin. This one is all about my hometown. I dedicate it to my hometown because that was part of my inspiration. Coming from a town like this, you won't believe the ideas you have the things you people talk about. And when I was younger, uh, I started as a story writer, a storyteller. Back in school, I remember I started telling horror stories. I didn't intend to be one, but when I started telling horror stories, people started gathering around me and there was always ghost stories. There was always horror or ghost stories. And it used to freak us out a lot. So this is my dedication to my hometown of how it all began. I'm going to read uh, one, one of the stories here. It's called That Oily Thing. I will tell you about that oily thing, how I got this idea. In fact, this whole book are from my childhood experiences, uh, how I got inspired, what influenced the stories, and what was it that got it all started. Okay, I'm just going to read a, a short snippet from this one. It's called That Oily Thing. Okay. She lived in the servants' quarters that was detached from the main house, linked only by a small cemented path. There was no way to contact anyone once the main house's doors were locked for the night. 
My mother had to endure being alone every night for about a year. Dad worked his fingers to the bone, returning home only late at night to sleep and then beginning his day again as early as six in the morning. He covered a wide range of activities in the construction line, from tiling floors to renovating homes, from driving lorries to delivering raw materials to the site. Although my mother was terrified of the surrounding darkness, she braved herself in that little locked room that was their home, doing some simple sewing to get through the lonely nights. She grew used to the sounds of the nocturnal creatures that were her only company. It wasn't until one night when the creatures fell completely silent. That was when she, she felt something was amiss. She peered out through the window, but it was too dark to make out anything. She had an ominous gut feeling that matters were going to take a turn for the worse. But she brushed out the thought and soldiered on with her needlework. My siblings were very young then, probably somewhere between three and five years old. Mom made sure they were safely tucked in and laid out beside her on the floor. It was one of those cold nights when my mother fell asleep before my father returned home. She must have been very tired from her chores that she didn't even realize that dad was already asleep beside her. When she felt his presence, she turned to face him and see if he was awake, but she could not see anything in the dark. She reached for him felt his arm and then froze. Something was not right. His arm was smooth, hairless. My dad had hairy arms and legs, coarse, weather-beaten skin. Whoever this was, his skin was slick, like oil. My mom didn't dare do anything, but she turned away from him to watch over my siblings. She could not run out of the room and leave them there. She kept very quiet, very still, wondering what she could do to raise an alarm to alert someone about the strange man lying beside her. Whatever his intentions were, they couldn't be good. Tears started welling up in her eyes, but she suppressed them to not show any signs that she knew about the intruder. He could easily hurt them if he wanted to. There was nothing within reach. No firewood, no tongs, no cutlery she could use as a weapon to defend herself and my siblings. The one thing she was prepared to do was to fight to her death to protect her children. She clenched her fists, gritted her teeth and waited. If the intruder laid even a finger on her or my siblings, she was going to scratch his eyes out. She was shocked when the light suddenly came on. Although it was only a low wattage bulb, it was sufficient to light up that meager little room and expose every corner of it. She swung about to confront the intruder when she saw my father locking the door. This story is actually partially true. My mother told me this story even way before I was born. We used to stay in this uh, house with my grandparents and uh, we used to stay at the seven quarters. It's like a small little hut detached from the main house. So it was only, there's a little path that leads right to the uh, little hut there, where it's just a room, there's nothing else. You just lock the door and the windows. So my mom told me one night, this exactly happened to her. So what happened was, she just fell asleep and she felt someone beside her. But of course, the story has a little bit twist uh, in them here and there. And she screamed. She screamed as loud as she could and the intruder just ran off. So from then on, she locked the door. And every night, she would carry all my siblings to the main house. She waited until my father came back from work, which could be like 11, 12, midnight. And then they would carry them back to the room one by one. That was how it was when we grew up. But uh, I didn't experience that. So when my mom told me that, I was shocked. I was, my goodness, how can anyone experience that? It's horrifying. 
And I link this to a story. I call it the oily man. In Malay, they call it orang minya, which uh, exactly directly translates to the oily man. It's a tale about this man who kind of sold his soul to the devil. It depends on which version you're talking, uh, listening to. And he had to kill virgins and he became oily. So he wanted to be handsome or something like that. I can't quite remember. So he had to kill the virgins. And there was a movie about it called Orang Minya. And he will draw a cross or on the victim's face. It was really, really scary. So I link my mom's story to a legend, kind of a legend, kind of a horror story that everyone in Malaysia knows about. So this is how uh, Typing Tales of Terror is all about. It's about our folklore, about our legends, about superstitions. And Typing is our small little town here. Actually, it's not as scary as uh, back then. It's a, it has a beautiful lake gardens. It's very peaceful and quiet. Not like those days when you go out, it's people tell you, oh, someone drowned in the lake gardens. Or there's something waiting up in a coconut tree, you know, things like that. So uh, this is what I would like to share with you. Thanks everyone for watching. Again, my name is Julia Uin. You can find this book uh, out on internet and you can buy from several places, including Penguin. And yeah, I suddenly lost it for words. The book that uh, I'll be reading from, which is also my most recent release, is called Never Have I Ever. Um, so it came out from Small Beer Press almost exactly six months ago. And it's a collection of stories from different genres, again, because I write across genres. A lot of them draw from Philippine mythology. And I do a lot of retellings because it's something I really love. Speaking about the horror stories specifically, a lot of them have to do with Filipino monsters because I personally think they are very cool um, and that we don't get to see them represented that often in media. So the book opens, for example, with the story of a creature called the Manananggal, which is our version of, I guess you would say it's a vampire. It's a lady who detaches her upper half from her lower half and then flies around at night eating, uh, you know, the guts out of people and sometimes babies as well. Uh, but she's a very friendly Manananggal, um, you know, making friends in California. And then um, another story deals with a man without a nose uh, and without a mouth, but he whistles. So, uh, you know, it's an urban legend type thing. And the story that I'll be reading from today is actually a ghost story. It is called, Have You Heard the One About Ana Maria Marquez? I'll be reading from the start of the story. Um, and it is a ghost story about the different types of ghosts you might encounter in a Catholic uh, elementary school, which is very similar to the one that I spent most of my childhood in growing up in the Philippines. So uh, I'll be reading from it. Um, it's not gonna be the full story, but you can read the full story in my book or online and I'll sh share where uh, after the reading. Have you heard the one about Ana Maria Marquez? It all started when Miss Salinas told us about her third eye. It was home ec and we were sitting in front of the sewing machines with table runners that we were going to make our moms or yayas do for us anyway. I was pretty anxious about that project. I knew mom was going to tell me to do it myself because she believed in the integrity of homework. Nika, mom would say, Jesus expects you to be honest and so do I. I was wondering how to get Yafeli to do it for me behind mom's back when Miss Selena started blabbing about the ghost on the bus. You see girls, most ghosts are very polite. At first, I didn't even notice he was a ghost. And then I realized the woman sitting next to him couldn't see him because she looked at me with this souplada face and said, Miss, are you not going to sit down? Then the ghost shrugged like, it's okay with me. So I had to sit on its lap while at the same time sitting on the bus seat. And that felt so weird. Miss Salinas was young and super skinny, which made up for her duck-like face. On the scale of teachers, she was neither bad nor good. She liked to wear white pants and a rumor had recently spread about how she liked to wear lime green thongs and was therefore slutty. We amused ourselves during home ec trying to look through her white pants every time she turned, crouched, or bent. Miss S, Estella piped up. By then we had realized that if we kept her occupied, she might forget to give us our assignment. 
When did you open your third eye? I was born with mine open, she said. My dad had it, and so did my Lolo. Oh, but my Kuya had to open his. He just forced it open one day by meditating. It's really easy as long as you know how. A snicker from somewhere in the back made her look at the clock. Girls, don't stop sewing. We obediently hopped to work. I stepped on my machine's presser, presser foot and stitched random lines through my table runner. Someone tugged on my elbow. Help, Hazel whispered. She gestured at her machine. The cloth was bunched up in the feed dog, the needle stabbing through it at random points. I reached over and jerked one end of the cloth until it came unstuck. It was now full of micro holes. She made a face. I smirked. You trying to give your cloth a third eye? I asked. Ana Maria Marquez was a student at St. Rebuffs, just like us. One day, she stayed after school to finish a project. At that time, the gardener was a creepy manol, and when he saw her staying in the classroom all by herself, he raped her. Then, because he did not want anyone to know about his crime, he killed her and hid her body in the hollow of the biggest rubber tree in the Black Garden. Nobody found out what had happened to her until after the manong died, when finally, a storm knocked over the rubber tree. That was years ago, it's grown back now, duh. And the police found her bones. If you look at the roots of the tree at night, you might see Anna Maria's face or some parts of her naked body. If you stand in the Black Garden and stay absolutely silent, you will hear her crying and calling for help. But you shouldn't go near, because if you do that, she will have her revenge and she will kill you. It was fifth grade, a weird time when we were all changing. It seemed like every week, someone was getting a bloodstain on her skirt and sobbing in the bathroom from shame and hormones while her barcada surrounded her vigilantly. At the start of the semester, we had a mandatory talk called You and Your Body. We were given little booklets with chick illustrations, diagrams of the female reproductive system, and free sanitary napkins. We spent a lot of our time vandalizing the chick illustrations. Leah found a way to turn a uterus into a ram by shading in the fallopian tubes, and we took turns drawing uterus rams in each other's notebooks. I held a slight disgust for all of this girl stuff, though I couldn't explain why. Maybe it was because I only had brothers and some of their that is gross attitude rubbed off on me. My skin crawled whenever mom or Yafeli or the homeroom teacher made some reference like, you are now a young lady, you are developing. Our barcada had decided that we would tell each other when we got ours and that would be it, no hysterics or anything. I was more afraid that someone was going to get a boyfriend. Bea, the class rep, took every chance she could to tell people about her darling Paolo from San Beda. I was fine with Bea having a boy, and Bea was my friend too, but she wasn't part of our group. If any of us got a boy, I knew the dynamic would change so much we'd be screwed. It was around this time, after all, that people's barcadas were getting shifted around, and that scared me more than I like to admit. I loved my friends and wanted us to stay the same forever. There were four of us. Me, Chella, Leah, and Hazel. Hazel and I were both in section C this year. Chella was in B and Leah was in D. We had all ended up at the same assigned lunch table in first grade and had continued eating lunch together since. We had our fights and silent periods and teary reconciliations like everyone else, but otherwise we were one of the tightest groups around. These girls were the sisters I'd never had and I thought we'd forgive each other anything. So when Hazel told me she had opened her third eye, I laughed in her face and thought nothing of it. Ana Maria Marquez was a student at St. Brebeuf's just like all of us. One day she took a piss in the third floor bathroom and the school bully locked her in laughing and called Ana Maria a stupid slut. No one knows why she hated Ana Maria so much. When the cleaning lady did her afternoon rounds, she was surprised to find the door locked. Inside, on the second stall from the left, she found the corpse of Ana Maria. Anna Maria had drowned herself by sticking her head in the toilet. That's why you should never use the third floor bathroom. If you use the second toilet from the left, Anna Maria Marquez will come out of the toilet right before you flush and ask why you bullied her and then kill you. If you use a different stall, she won't kill you. She'll just float on the ceiling and look down at you and ask you why. The annual school fair was coming up. 
Based on a random draw, the seventh graders were assigned the concert and the sixth graders were going to work with the PTA for the bazaar, which would include goodies baked by the fourth graders. Our year level, the fifth grade, got the haunted house. Bea announced right before recess one Monday. The fair was pretty much the only time each year that boys were allowed on campus, which meant a lot of squealing. Section A was doing a freaky dollhouse inspired by Chucky. Section B was recreating the well from the ring. My section, Section C, was staging a haunted traditional Filipino home, and Section D was enacting ritual sacrifice. There was a cash prize for the scariest section, so Bea insisted we do well. While people were yelling at each other to sign up for the time slots and committees, Hazel pulled me aside and said she didn't really want to do this, now that she had opened her third eye. I laughed and continued to cram my science homework. What's so funny? I looked at her, annoyed. Um, you just told me you opened your third eye. But I did. Her eyebrows were furrowed and her eyes were taking on that buggy, frantic look they did when she was priming for an argument. I considered this. Hazel was one of my best friends, but she was also an attention seeker. She was the only one among us who had broken the rules and cried passionately when she got hers, describing her intense stomach pains as being like giving birth. I mean, it must have hurt a little, but she was fine by the next day. Lately, I had been thinking that if anyone changed anything in our gang, it would be Hazel and her weird theatrics. It was probably the lack of a real drama club in our school. I stopped writing. Why would you want to do that? Because, she said, I've always wanted to see. I remember our failed ghost hunt during stargazing night in third grade when we were both part of the nature club. We had squealed and scurried through the halls, waving our flashlights, and nothing had come out. No spirit balls, not even a little wheeze from the, fame, from the famed Anna Maria Marquez. Then again, we didn't make it to the third floor because as we were creeping up the stairs, a security guard spotted us and told us that area was closed. And, I asked, feeling the precious recess minutes drain away, have you seen anything? She shook her head. But I've, I've started hearing things, whispering, weird noises, sometimes singing. I couldn't tell if this delighted her or freaked her out. I was not a ghost person. If you had my mom, who routinely doused the house in holy water and never stepped into her parents' home without begging her dad, rest in peace, Lolo, not to come out and spook her, you probably wouldn't be either. I preferred my dad's stance, laughing and shaking his head because mom was a provinciana through and through. Besides, I always had my scapular to protect me from evil. It was a gift from my ninang at baptism, a brown cloth string that linked two images of Our Lady which I wore around my neck. Mom insisted I never take it off, just in case I died suddenly, because it guaranteed entrance to heaven. Sure, any confessions from the Capris yet? Hazel gripped my shoulder. You really don't believe me? I'll believe him when I see him. I tried to say this comically, fakely, so that she would understand that I wasn't trying to be mean. But I guess I used the wrong tone of voice because she said, fine, be that way, and stalked off. Ana Maria Marquez was a senior in high school when she committed suicide by hanging herself on the Higa tree next to the parking lot. Her boyfriend had dumped her for one of the popular girls and she was so distraught that she had decided to teach him a lesson. She only meant to scare him and his new girl or so her burkada said afterward. She was supposed to freak them out by pretending to hang herself except it all went wrong. Her foot slipped on the branch she was stepping on or something, I'm not making this up. This really happened. It was all over the news and stuff. Of course, the boyfriend freaked out and broke up with the new girl and then had psychological issues all his life. And the tree, which was once a pretty tree, is now full of fat, hairy he guts crawling around or dangling in the breeze. And if they fall on you, you will get a really bad rash. So that's the part everyone in Manila knows. Now here's the part only the girls of St. Rebuff know. If you walk beneath the Higa tree after the school has closed down, Sometimes you will see her shadow on the concrete, the shadow of a hanging girl. Don't look up. If you look up, you might see her and she might talk to you. No one knows what she says. No one who has heard her talk has survived. And that's where I will stop the reading. So again, uh, the name of the story was, have you heard the one about Ana Maria Marquez? And you can read the full thing 
on Nightmare Magazine. It's available online. Um, you can visit my website to find it, uh, which is isabelliap.com, or um, you can read it in my collection, uh, Never Have I Ever, um, which you can buy really anywhere online, um, Amazon, IndieBound, um, Book Depository, or you can go to my publisher's website, Small Beer Press, or you can request it from an indie bookstore near you. So thank you so much for listening to my story time and um, have a great rest of your day. <laughs> I have two books coming out this fall. The first is The All-Consuming World, a sci-fi heist book about ex-cons coming back for one last heist and intergalactic pop stars in between everything else that's going on. And the other book that's coming out three weeks later, because my life has shaken out this way, <laughs> it's nothing but black and teeth. A haunted house novella about five friends, and I use the quotation marks very seriously, coming together to celebrate a wedding in a haunted house that it shouldn't be in. Needless to say, everything ends up terrible. Today, I will be reading a short story I wrote for Uncanny Magazine, Monologue by an Unnamed Mage, recorded at the brink of the end. It is, as you might have imagined, a sort of like almost apocalyptic story. It is a little bit of a monologue. It is very passionate, very romantic. I think honestly, this is probably the most romantic thing I've ever written while still being very deeply mean that it is very, very horror driven. I wanted to tell you in case opportunity absence itself forever, that it doesn't matter. That your magic is algorithmic. The mind is an abstraction of reality. That yours demands cartographic soliloquies, a reverse of phrase and a phase of mathematics and momentum every word you speak a part of the map and you build the rules as you recite them the mind is raw sensation synesthetic sinewy as sex worthless with context worth everything on the ledge at the end of time hold we have to hold the line that i can speak through my spells and you can't that you have the world tessellated in amber while nothing of my magic will mark this of only a faint lambency, a stove of candlelight staining, the black gold kintsuki bowls your mother gave us, that our friends are dying and the gods are coming, many bodied in the middle of night, that the fucking door won't open, although we've made it keys of our bodies, keys of bone and breath and broken promises. All of this doesn't matter. What matters is the night when I first met you and how cold the air was and how the ice needled my breath and how you stood there with your hangdog smile, your hair rough tangled and the light in your eyes, sacred scent in the shyness was better than anything the heavens could stitch from the suns. What matters is that I asked you to run away with me and you said yes. And then we kept running even after our orders came hunting for us, seven to a coven, like we meant something. They like were bigger than two people making vows of the salt silver aid. That they dragged us back, bound in brambles and bronze. That they made us choose between being separated or being part of the vanguard against the apocalypse. All that is of no importance. That we laughed at their ultimatum. That we said yes. That we held hands as they told us we probably wouldn't come back. That is what matters. What matters is that I love you and that I will always love you. And I won't let him have you. Even I have to huss myself of all that I am and splinter the universe again. You're mine and I am yours. And why are gods to people? I've seen the continents fold up like paper plane. I made you a promise the first night of our expedition. Do you remember that? Lying on our backs. Like a spread over the brittle grass, a charred skin of stars strung up above us. We laid there counting the constellations as they vanished into the black. Our hands intertwined, your hair so dark. I told you other was protect you. You laughed. Like, was that a crime? You said you'd keep me safe too. I remember the blacksmith and the curls of her long hair like wedding rings forever treaded with lilac. And I remember the bard, the cook, the huntress, the knights who came at last, their armor gilded with rust, the Lord's body held safe between them. There were others too, I remember that. Like the crossbowmen, their skin mantled with scars, like the priests 
who wore burgundy at his collar instead of white. But if faces were taken along with the names of our friends Ethan, nothing but grit in the teeth of those numinous bastards. Don't falter, please. This is a kind of magic too, you know. The bard told me this. Resurrection by way of oration, every repelling a species of necromancy. And if some of it fails to be beautiful, if some of it crooks from the truth, that doesn't matter. Stories are meant to adapt. I used to wonder what was the purpose of the bard, if she had a purpose, if there was any meaning to putting music to our massacre, if it would be better to just forget, easier, safer to bury our dead and the decay and pretend it was always like this. She asked me one night, what then would be the point? If we were just going to forsake what we loved, forget why we fought, forswear that chance we might make it. Although the sky is unmade in the fractals, why not just let the gods win? Without stories, there is no memory, no trajectory to illuminate what came before and what might come after. Without stories, there can be no hope. The fact that the gods don't understand this is what will ensure we'll find our way home. Because nothing is just fact, and though the world is cinders, if enough people believe, we'll make it. There's still soil to grow miracles. Yes, I heard that scream too. How could I not? But don't look back. That's not our part of the stories. Ours is the chapter engrossed with the task of holding our ground. Be careful, beloved. See how they've crept the borders of our barriers, the villi seeking cracks, seeking the gaps made by our grief. Let me help. I'm going to marry you when we survive this. I decided this on the road between here and the ruins of the last elvish capital. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. It never seemed like the right time. But you might as well know now, as opposed to later or never, that I intend to marry you by salt and silver. With the sea as our witness and the mountains as our minister, by the shore at the edge of the world, by the house in which all this began, that I plan to wear white and in my dreams to wear silk, and though there might be nothing but handfuls of hope to hold in the cup of my palm, I intend to make your home and a hearth. <laughs> that smile of yours, that light in your gaze, the way you look at me even now, while the universe buckles under the weight of its steps, that is what matters. You are my story. It's beginning, it's happy conclusion. More than anything else, more than this world, more than this life. You are what matters. The door is open. I think someone sold their soul to shatter that lock. Are you ready? We can do this. Take my hand. Um, and that's it for the story. Thank you for listening. Again, this is Cassandra Kaw. You can find me on twitter.com slash cast Kaw. My website is cassandrakaw.net. And the all-consuming world and nothing but black and teeth will be available in bookstores. If not, it should be on Amazon and other preferred and common platforms. Again, thank you so much. I'm going to go die for allergies now. <laughs>